Grace and peace be unto you from God, our Creator, and from our Lord and Savior Jesus. You may say, Amen. Amen. I ran into someone from church the other day, I had a really interesting conversation with this person. And uh, I asked how Christmas went, and uh, Christmas was fine and, and, and the like. But then they, they made this comment that, that, that resonated with me. The person said, you know, after Christmas, I always feel a kind of a letdown. And that makes so much sense to me. I, I don't know how many of you have gone through that. But when you think about it, we have this build up to Christmas. We look forward to seeing people. We got everything that gets decorated. And, and we go through a lot of effort to do this. And, and we, we give presents to people. And we look forward to giving the presents. And, and people give stuff to us. And it's a great celebration. We have the meals, the festivities, the gatherings and everything. And then all of a sudden, boom, it's over. I don't know about you, but then there's the dread of having to take all the decorations down. And it's so disappointing. There's the realization we're not going to see some of those people for a while again. And you know, maybe it's back to the same old meals that we were having in September and, and, uh, and no more cookies and sweets anymore. And, and uh, there's this letdown. For some people, we keep our decorations up until around Lent, so it's not so much of a, deck, of a letdown. But most people take them down right away or very soon thereafter. Now, not only is there a letdown that's just kind of endemic to the season, but, but now we, we deal with this, this Omicron thing. I mean, good Lord. And no one anticipated this. And it kind of casts us into this uh, almost a kind of spiritual darkness. Especially if you anticipated that we would get back to some kind of uh, more regularity. It might not be the way it used to be, but at least it would have some semblance to the way life used to be. And now I think about some people in our church. I think about Laura. Good Lord, she's got to go to, to, to teach. And that has to be a burden. If you have children going back to school, that has to be a burden, a, a great concern. I think about your shared and the kids uh, going back into the school system. I think about uh, our Laura here, who has a young child. So in this time of great concern, a time, really, kind of a, a time of darkness. The question comes for us, what is God's call to you and me at these moments? And so my suggestion this morning, is something for you to ponder, I would suggest to you that God's call to us is to be a sign of hope a light of hope in the midst of this. How do I mean that? When you and I take care of ourselves, when we recognize the truth of the scenario that we're in, when we wear masks, when we get the vaccinations, when we maintain distance, at some level, what we're saying is, I have something to live for. That's hope. At some level, what we're saying is, I treasure this gift that I have received. The gift of life. That's hope. At times, it, it bothers me when I know that there are people who take risks that aren't necessary. And it troubles me, as I'm sure it troubles many people, to know that there are folks who don't want to get vaccinated. And what troubles me is that uh, I understand freedom of choice. I understand that uh, you know, this is my choice, this is what I want to do. But the problem is, is there are repercussions for other people. I'm 
terribly burdened for the healthcare people, especially those working in the hospitals, people like Mark, who, who, who are seeing all of these uh, cases come before them and who need to tend to them, and as a result, they can't tend to some other people who need medical care. The choice not to get vaccinated, for instance, or the choice not to wear a mask, or the choice to take risks, it's just not about me. Because if I get sick, it means other people may not be able to get medical care. It goes far beyond me. So one thing that I believe God calls us to do is to be people who treasure this gift of life and who understand that our behavior and our actions potentially have implications for other people. So what did Jesus say? Love God, treasure the gift, love others. It's an act of love for other people when I carry myself and live with caution. Even though I live with caution, I still may get ill. I think we all understand that. But when I carry myself with caution, it shows that I care about other people. And I don't want them to suffer because of my behavior. So as Christian people, I think that is one way in which we are the light of hope in the midst of this darkness that we face. And we also, Jesus said, it's fascinating, Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, I will give you rest because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If we have a concern for the world around us and the people around us, you and I are carrying a burden. I am very burdened for the people who need medical care and can't get it. I read an account from a man here in Vermont, I think he's in Bennington, uh, who uh, needs back surgery. It's in Vermont Digger, I believe. He needs back surgery. He can't get an appointment because the hospital is booked. We carry that burden for other people because of the way in which this situation has evolved. So as Christian people, hopefully we can be a sign of hope now, the passage in the Bible was, the word became flesh. In other words, God who is mysterious, God who no one has seen, God who is beyond us, God who is invisible. Uh, God is revealed to us in the person of Jesus. And Jesus points us to the character and the nature of God. The word, God, becomes flesh because Jesus in the flesh points us to an understanding, a revelation of who God is. We also become the embodiment, if you will, of hope by the way in which we live. We become the embodiment of love by the way in which we live. We become, in essence, God's presence through us when we take care of ourselves and when we demonstrate that concern for the people around us by the way in which we take care of ourselves. So, how we comport ourselves, the way in which we live, I think James speaks of that in the second reading, the way in which we live becomes a sign of God's presence. And that is not always an easy path to follow. It, it really calls for us to be steadfast in standing for what we believe in. Because there are people who will disagree with us. And then it's, it's hard to stand fast and say, oh, I'm not going to do that. Uh, it's too much of an unnecessary risk. I'm not going to go there. That is very, very difficult to do. So it's not an easy path to follow. This is not something, you know, uh, well, obviously you should do this. It's not necessarily easy for a lot of people to do. Second, I want to share with you the story of a friend of mine. Uh, I have to adjust this. I can't breathe. I share with you a story of a friend of mine when I was a little kid. When I was a little boy, our family used to go to Northfield, Massachusetts. There's a little community up in the woods. We had a cabin up there. And so I, I grew up in the middle of the inner city. It was just a concrete jungle. 
And so I loved going to Northfield because it was, you know, we were in the forest and, and you could do all kinds of great, you could build forts in the forest. I mean, it was terrific. I was just a little kid, four or five years old. And I used to get up in the morning when I was up there and I would look forward to Brucey coming up to Northfield. His family came from Chicago. And um, the hope was that their vacation might match our vacation so I'd have a playmate. So I would get up in the morning and I would go down to see Brucey. His name was Brucey Kidd. And if I got there early in the morning, uh, I would have to sit out on the porch and wait for him because he would be inside and he would be sprawled over his father's knees with his back up and his father would pound on his back, little six-year-old boy. And Brucey would cough up all of this stuff. And I was a little kid, I was clueless as to what was going on. But every morning, Brucey had to go through this with his father. And what I knew was that Brucey couldn't walk up the big hills and Brucey couldn't run. It wasn't until I was older that I realized that he had cystic fibrosis. And so Brucey was given to doing things that were sedate, that he could manage. Now, if you think back for a little bit, what do you think Brucey might be drawn to do as a child who, who was sedate, couldn't do the running around and all that? What do you think he might have been inclined to do as a kid? Uh, Laura and Debbie and Marsha are here, so I'm going to ask them. What do you think he might have been, Marsha might even know the story, so I'm not going to ask her. So I'm, going to, I'm going to put Laura and Debbie on the spot. What do you think he might have been drawn to do as an eight or a nine-year-old little boy? Watch he, TV. Watch TV. Oh, this is a long time. I had 65 years. This is 60 years ago. <laughs> 60 years ago, you had three stations on the TV. And there's nothing to watch. There's no. There is definitely a generational gap here. <laughs> there is. There. We we didn't have video games back then. You, you, some of the old timers here are going to remember this. Anna and Bob will be all over this. I'm sure they will. Beverly and Dick will be all over this. I'm sure they will. They, remem they will remember the old days. And if they didn't do these things, their parents would have done these things. What do you think that Brucey did? You have to go back, you know, 67 years. What do you think he did as a kid? You know what he did? He collected coins. Sure. Do you remember your parents doing that? My father collected coins. He had a little co blue coin book and you put the pennies in there and you had to look at the coins. I got in big trouble one day when I took this big thing of coins and went to the grocery store and bought something. My father hadn't gone through the coins yet. So that, that, that put me in thin ice with him for a while. He used to collect coins. So what Christmas time, his father, uh, uh, his father and mother were, were getting gifts for the kids. Bruce, he had a brother, Peter, and uh, a sister, uh, Pamela. They bought gifts for the kids. And what Bruce really wanted was a one coin to complete his coin set, but it was really expensive. And uh, the family did not have very much money. So getting that coin was not part of the agenda. So uh, Christmas time came, Christmas Day came, and, and the three kids were downstairs, and they opened up all their presents, and Mom and Dad were there, and there was a big rejoicing, and you know the Christmas scene. And uh, Brucey opened up his gifts, he was very happy and everything, and his father said to him, he said, um, go to the kitchen and look around. Brucey looked at his father and said, you know, like, what for? And his father said, there's one more gift. So he was excited. So he went to the kitchen and looked on the kitchen table and on the countertops and he came back out and he said, I didn't find anything. Father said, you just got to look harder. So he went in there and he went through all the drawers and the pots and pans and couldn't find anything. He said, I can't find anything. And the father said, there's one more gift. You've got to go look for it. So he's beside himself. I mean, where is this gift? And then he finally figured out, okay, I'm going to take the chair and put it next to the icebox. I'm going to get on top of the chair. And there on top of the icebox, there was this little box. 
So he trundled off to the to the living room with his parents, and they start opening the box. He opened the box, and there's a smaller box inside. And then he opened that box, there's a smaller box inside. So finally, he found just this tiny little box, right about that big. Big enough for what? Yeah, right. And there it was. A coin for his coins. Brucey died that year. But before he died, he had that one more gift. Yeah. How do we live with hope? In this time, how are we the incarnation, if you will, the reality of hope? It's when you and I know that there is one more gift. And each day we wake up realizing this day has one more gift, that every day has one more gift. We live with the anticipation of finding that gift. Even when it comes time to the end, we live with the confidence that the end is not the end. Because there is one more gift. So I hope that all of us and look at our days ahead in a difficult time and realize that God is with us in this. Can I find today's gift? Can I see it? It said the world did not recognize God, but God was among them. Can I recognize God's gift to me this day? I, I look at this and I say, Debbie is God's gift to me today. Marcia's singing is God's gift to me today. Laura being here is God's gift to me. Now, I learned to have three gifts. The day is just beginning. Look for one more gift. Live with that anticipation because the gift is there. It's just up to us to see it. It's up to us to find it. So take good care of yourself. That's a witness to Christ's presence within you. It is a witness to your hope because you've got something to live for. And when you take care of other people, you are giving them hope. You are in essence saying you have something to live for. And let us live each day looking for you tell me. Thank you for your attention. I say these things to them. In the name of Jesus, the light that shines in our darkness. Amen. Amen.